Hello and welcome to our latest Fenwick Elliott webinar. I am Jeremy Glover and I'm pleased to welcome my colleagues, partner Dr Stacey Sinclair and George Boddy, who has recently been promoted to become one of our senior associates. As you probably know by now, you are all on mute, but if you do have any questions, please use the comment box and all questions will be asked anonymously. Um, and so today we're going to look at adjudication. We first started providing our adjudication update seminars as they then were, over 20 years ago. The first one was back in October 2000. And this is our fourth adjudication update webinar. Um, and unfortunately, today's webinar, we've got a minor technical issue. So in the best, um, following the best traditions of Chris Whitty, we should be adopting the um, next slide, please, um, uh, uh, approach. So if we have the next slide, I would better tell you what we're going to be looking at um, today. Um, and with today's agenda, um, we're going to give you a quick re recap of what you will have either missed or you'll, you'll be familiar with from our webinars from last year. And then we're going to look at adjudication in um, 2021. Um, we're going to focus on natural justice because that's one of the topics I think has been of most importance over the last three or four months. Um, and we're going to be looking at, say, the adjudication in 2021. And actually, we're going to be focusing quite a lot on cases from Scotland. Um, so next slide. Um, we thought we'd start with a quick look about what happened in 2020. What were the key developments? Well, next slide. The Supreme Court in Bresco confirmed what I think we in the construction industry already knew about adjudication. Adjudication was designed to be, and it's actually proven to be, a mainstream form of dispute resolution. And the advantages are it produces, in many cases, a final resolution of most disputes that are referred to an adjudicator. But better than that, the sheer availability of adjudication has meant that many disputes are actually settled without the need to even resort to um, adjudication. Now, Bresco is and was an important case, and people talked a lot about it. But that endorsement of adjudication from the highest court in the United Kingdom is sometimes missed, and I think it's, it's something of fundamental importance. Um, and thinking about talking about um, Supreme Court cases, which everyone has spent a lot of time discussing. Next slide. Um, one of the interesting issues was, were there any lessons for adjudication in the Halliburton judgment? Now, as most of you will already know, this was an adjudication case, uh, sorry, an arbitration case about whether an arbitrator should have disclosed that he had been appointed in a couple of related arbitrations to do with the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Um, and what did the case do? Well, it confirmed the long-standing test for apparent bias. It confirmed that there was a legal duty of impartiality for um, decision makers. Um, it confirmed there's a duty of disclosure um, on the part of decision makers about potential conflicts of interest. But that's already a requirement of the adjudicator appointing bodies. Um, it's a requirement of TEXA, the Construction Solicitors Association. Um, I am one of an adjudicator on the TEXA panel. And every time I get notice of a potential appointment, I am reminded that I cannot accept an appointment where I've got a conflict of interest, or if I'm aware of any potential involvements, interests, or relationships that might affect my independence or impartiality. So could Halliburton actually ever have arisen with adjudicator to adjudication? To be honest, it's quite difficult to imagine. Um, paragraph eight of this scheme says that an adjudicator can only act at the same time on related disputes under different contracts if the parties consent. So there's openness amongst everyone. Um, so I suspect that the position the arbitrator in Halliburton found himself in would not have arisen had he been an adjudicator rather than an arbitrator. Because adjudicators have a, a statutory duty of impartiality under Section 108.2 of the Housing Grants Act. And logically, adjudicators must be under legal obligation for disclosure. So from an adjudication point of view, at least, the Halliburton case stands as no more than a useful reminder. So what else did we learn last year? N next slide. Um, well, adjudication continued pretty much as usual during 2020. The TCC made it clear they expected parties to be sensible, to take reasonable steps to ensure adjudications could proceed, 
depending on whatever lockdown measures we were all faced with. And that's what happened. And you saw throughout the year a number of enforcement cases coming before the courts, um, sometimes slightly surprising ones. I mean, getting the formalities right, fundamental importance, ensuring you serve your notice of adjudication before appointing the adjudicator is a key step. But it cropped up in a case last year. Um, slightly more controversial, um, additional information. When does a dispute crystallize? When is there a new claim? In the High Tech and Balfour Beatty case in Jul on the 30th of July 2019, Balfour Beatty served a delay analysis, a detailed report. Eight days later, they served a notice of adjudication, noting that a dispute had arisen in relation to their entitlement to an extension of time. Um, and that dispute had arisen in November 2018. Now, unsurprisingly to many people, High Tech said, well, had a dispute crystallized. Um, it was only eight days and we had to digest this report. The contract said we've got 16 weeks to um, assess a claim. Well, the TCC, and I think, I think it's very much a pro adjudication decision. They said they were looking at the issue in a sensible and commercial um, way. So they had a look at the report. The report had a detailed critical path analysis. The total extension of time claim was slightly longer than the claim that Balfour Beatty had previously made. But significantly, the report wasn't materially different to the delay claim that had been advanced earlier. So therefore, what it was, was it wasn't new. It was an analysis that had been prepared to support Balfour Beatty's claim for an extension of time. For, for a dispute that had already crystallized. So the sensible commercial pro adjudication decision was to allow the uh, report in as part of the um, adjudication. Next slide, please. Um, and severance is another pro uh, useful pro adjudication tool. By severance, what we mean is if a part of the decision turns out to have been made without jurisdiction, it may be possible to sever the bad from the good and re retain the good part of the decision. And the courts last year were clear that they were gonna take a practical and flexible approach in order to try and enforce as much of the adjudicator's decision as possible, to enforce that part of the decision that was valid. So again, as I say, a pro adjudication approach from the courts. There was also other things you need to be careful of. You have to be careful every step of the way with adjudication. Um, if you're going to dispute a decision, you're still going to be liable to pay the adjudicator's fees, almost certainly. But take care when you do that to make clear to reserve your position so that no one can then say that you've somehow accepted or affirmed the decision. And if you're looking to bring finality to a dispute, if you're looking to bring apart a proceedings about a matter, maybe about a matter of con contract interpretation, take care to make sure that it's a short contained dispute. And most importantly of all, it's got to be something that arose in the adjudication, which is the subject of the claim that you're bringing forward. And of course, there was Bresco. Next slide, please. Um, and Bresco was important. But it's important for one simple reason. It said that in certain circumstances, insolvent party can commence adjudication proceedings. We learned towards the end of last year that those circumstances include ring fencing any sums and adjudicator orders to be paid over and providing security for costs. And finally, we got confirmation from the Court of Appeal about fraud. If an adjudication was arguably procured by fraud, then assuming those allegations couldn't have been part of the adjudication process, those allegations may be a proper ground for resisting enforcement. Um, so 2020 was a busy year for adjudication enforcement. Next slide, please. Um, but were there more adjudications? Well, tantalizingly, we don't yet know. Um, these are the stats that the um, Adjudication Society help produce. And they seem to suggest that between um, nine, 2019, 2020, there was a slight tail off in the increase in adjudications. Um, anecdotally, um, my experience is I think they were going, to, they were, we will find that the new figures will show that there were more adjudications. And techs are introducing low value dispute schemes, and the CIC being something similar, I think will tend to confirm that. 
Um, now, back in October to 2000, one of the hot topics was natural justice. There was a case, Disgain and OPEC prime, prime, which had just come out, where the judge didn't enforce the adjudicator's decision because it was felt there was a serious risk of bias. What had happened is that the adjudicator had had private telephone conversations with one party and hadn't made the other party a party to those, those conversations. It was felt that the adjudicator had overstretched the rules. Now, of course, 20 years on, everyone's moved on. We all take care to avoid situations like that. But back in the day, back in October 2000, um, there was a concern that this case might be the start of a movement to fetter adjudication. That was why it was a hot topic. Now, happily, that didn't happen. But natural justice continues 20 years later to be an issue of some importance. And this is something my colleague George um, is now going to explain in a, in a little more detail. So <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as many will know, there are two main grounds upon which it is possible to challenge the decision of an adjudicator. First, the adjudicator does not have jurisdiction. And second, as Jeremy has mentioned, the adjudication breached the rules of natural justice. But yet, for those of you familiar with the adjudication process, you'll be aware that not, it's rare to have an adjudication go by without submissions being made on one or both of these issues. Such arguments aren't often successful uh, and can sometimes appear a little bit desperate. Um, but as many and, and as many will know, the courts are very keen to enforce the decisions of adjudicators um, and take a robust approach to doing so. And the case law in 2020 um, certainly showed that. However, the recent case of Global Switch and Sudlows, <clears throat> in which the court refused to enforce the decision of an adjudicator, because of a breach of the rules of natural justice, is a reminder that these arguments are, are still worth running. So before discussing that case in a bit more detail, um, I'm going to prov provide a quick recap on, on the law of natural justice in adjudication. So up on the slide there, I've put two of the key principles from which the case law has developed. First, an, a party should be informed of the allegations against it and be given an opportunity to answer those allegations. And second, the party is entitled to have its case heard by an unbiased and impartial tribunal. So the Court of Appeal uh, confirmed in the um, early days of adjudication in the Carillion and AMEC cases uh, that the rules of natural justice do apply to adjudicators. Um, however, they decided that it would only be in cases of serious breach where the courts would intervene uh, and refuse to enforce a decision. The Court of Appeal also emphasised in those cases that there should be a limit to the requirements of natural justice in, in adjudications, given that it's intended to be a speedy process, that there is therefore an inbuilt unfairness. Um, and of course, an unsuccessful party can seek relief by way of litigation or arbitration if they're unhappy with the decision. So <clears throat> these principles were developed in the TCC in, in the Cantalon and Avasco case. Uh, and in that case, the court decided that courts, when assessing um, questions of natural justice, shouldn't take an over-analytical approach. Any challenge must be plain, clear and comprehensible. And the court also decided that a two-stage test must apply. First, does the adjudicator fail to apply the rules of natural justice? And second, is the breach serious and more than peripheral? Uh, next slide, please. So, broadly speaking, there are two main categories of breaches of the rules of natural justice that have emerged in the case law over the years. First, conflict of interest or apparent bias, and second, the right to a fair hearing. So this slide contains some recent examples, well, most of them are recent examples, but it's far from ex exhaustive. Um, as Jeremy have mentioned uh, early, earlier on in the presentation in relation to the Halliburton case, uh, decisions can be challenged on the basis of a conflict of interest or if there's a or if there's apparent bias that passes the fair-minded and informed observer test uh, but successful challenges on this ground are relatively rare right to a fairing fair hearing challenges come in many different forms and, and are much more common and they usually involve a claim that something was wrong with the procedure or that the adjudicator failed to take something into account or took something into account that perhaps he shouldn't have done it is perhaps surprising that the courts, sorry, it's perhaps not surprising that the courts have uh, given short shrift to lack of time arguments, um, given that the adjudication process is inherently supposed to be a speedy one. 
And the TCC in the uh, uh, Willow case on the slide um, said that it would be a rare case where the court will decline to enforce an adjudication on the basis of the adequacy of the time allowed. As regards size or complexity, the court confirmed in AMEC Group and Thames Water Utilities uh, that complaints about a referral being too large or too complex wouldn't be or would be very unlikely to establish a breach of natural justice. Natural justice arguments are more likely to be successful when they involve a complaint that the adjudicator has failed to take something into account. For example, in the case of Core Building Cleaver on the slide, the court held that there had been a breach of natural justice where the adjudicator had decided a determinative point, but this had not been argued by the referring party. That meant that the responding party hadn't had a chance to, to address this point. Other examples of challenges include the failure to give a, a party a fair opportunity to respond to evidence served by one party later on in the process. Reliance on own materials. So in that case, on the, sli on the slide, the adjudicator obtained an independent expert report that he relied on in giving his decision, but he didn't allow the parties to comment on it. Another common ground, arguably the most common, is failure to consider a party's defence. This was one of the grounds relied upon in the Sudlows and Global Switch case that I'll come on to. In the uh, Barhel uh, case, um, the outer house of the Court of, Court of Session um, in Scotland found that an adjudicator had failed to address one of the critical issues referred to it for determination. And that had been argued and um, emphasised in all of the responding parties' pleadings, but it didn't feature at all in his decision. The court therefore decided that the adjudicator in that case had failed to exhaust his jurisdiction. And the effect of that was that the decision was unenforceable. So uh, next slide, please. So moving on to Global Switch. Well, in this case, the TCC refused to enforce the adjudicator's decision, holding that the adjudicator had materially breached the rules of natural justice by failing to consider a claim for loss and expense that Sutherlows had raised as a defense to Global Switch's claim for payment. So just a brief rundown of the facts. Sudlows were appointed pursuant to a JCT design and build contract for the fit out and upgrade of Global Switch's specialist data center at East India Dock. Disputes, various disputes arose between the parties and four adjudications followed, the fourth of which was the subject of the enforcement decision. So in the fourth adjudication, Global Switch sought a decision as the true value of parts of interim application 27 and an order that Sutlo should pay the sum of 6.8 million to Global Switch. In the notice of adjudication, Global Switch sought to expressly exclude certain matters from the scope of the adjudication, including Sudlow's entitlement to further extensions of time and further loss and expense, and the question of liability for two alleged defects in Sudlow's works, first of which was a high voltage cable installation, and the second of which was potential overloading of the roof. Sudlow's, of course, disputed this. Its position on the true value of interim application 27 included claims arising from the matters that Global Switch had tried to exclude from the scope of the adjudication. However, it argued that it was entitled to raise any defence open to it to defend its claim in interim application 27 and, and to defend Global Switch's claim for payment. Sudlow's proceeded to defend Global Switch's claim for payment in the adjudication by seeking a determination from the adjudicator as to their entitlement to further extensions of time and loss and expense. But in his decision, the adjudicator decided that Global Switch was entitled to limit the scope of his jurisdiction to the scope, to, to the specified parts of interim uh, application 27, and that he did not have jurisdiction to award further extensions of time or any loss and expense to Sudlow's. The adjudicator reached a decision on the true value of, of the elements of the account that had been referred to it were referred to him by Global Switch and awarded them the sum of around five million pounds. So next slide, please. So moving on to, to the law. Well, the judge in this case, the head of the TCC, Mrs. Justice O'Farrell, very helpfully set out 10 key principles um, which are applicable in this situation. Um, and those will be set out on this slide in the next. Um, and I'll briefly summarise them. Um, 
So first, she said that the referring party can de define a dispute referred to adjudication how it chooses. The responding party cannot widen uh, the scope of the dispute unilaterally um, and can raise any defences to rebut the claims made, but this doesn't amount to a widening of the adjudication scope. If the referring party seeks a declaration of the value of specific elements of the works, then the responding cannot, uh, party cannot seek a declaration of the value of other elements of the works. However, if a referring party seeks an order for payment, the responding party can rely on all available defences to it, including the valuation of other works uh, in set off of, of, of the claims made. So next slide, please. It's, it's ultimately up to the adjudicator to decide if, if the defence brought by the responding party um, in, in set off of any claim for payment made is, is valid and a good defence. Um, but ultimately, if the adjudicator asks the right question, it doesn't matter if he gets it wrong, the decision will still be enforced. However, if the adjudicator fails to consider the defence, then that may well amount to a breach of natural justice, which if material, will result in the decision not being, being enforced. So next slide, please. So the decision. So applying those principles, uh, Mrs. Justice O'Farrell decided that Global Switch had brought a, a sort of payment resulting from a true valuation of interim application 27. Sadlow's defence to that claim for payment relied on its own claims for loss and expense arising from extensions of time. Those claims involved the high voltage cable works and the overloading of the roof that Global Switch had attempted to exclude from the adjudication by submitting to the adjudicator that he could proceed on the assumption that they were not defective. Well, the judge decided that while this addressed Global Switch's defects claims, it didn't address Sudlow's claims for additional payment for uh, loss and expense. Sudlow's lo these loss and expense claims were clearly relevant to the uh, valuation of interim application 27 for the purpose of any payment, as they were a valid defence to, to that claim. Therefore, the adjudicator ought to have considered them, but he, but he didn't because he wrongly assumed that he didn't have jurisdiction to do so. As Global Switch had sought not only a true valuation of specific parts of the account, but also an award of payment, he ought to have considered Sudlow's defence to the claim to pay for payment. The determination of that claim for payment required him to consider all matters raised by Sudlow's in support of its case that it was entitled to additional sums as part of the valuation of interim application 27. However, ultimately, the judge decided that the adjudicator's failure to take uh, into account that defence uh, amounted to a breach of the rules of natural justice um, and she refused to enforce the decision. Um, just as, uh, as an aside, Sudlow's um, also resisted the enforcement on two other grounds, which were not successful. Uh, they argued that the adjudicator had failed to take um, their claim for a payment of a bank guarantee into account, uh, but the judge decided that the adjudicator had, in fact, taken that argument into account. Uh, so there was no breach of natural justice there. Sudos also argued that the decision was contrary to a decision of a previous adjudicator, um, but the judge decided that actually um, the decision of the present adjudicator didn't infringe upon the previous decision. So that argument was also dismissed. Um, but Sudlow's success on the first argument meant the decision wasn't enforced. So just by way of a couple of concluding points to, to take from, from that case. So it's clear that adjudicators must be very careful not to take an overly restrictive view of their jurisdiction uh, and fail to take into account party submission, else the, uh, uh, submissions, else they'll clearly risk giving an unenforceable decision. And I suppose referring parties should also be aware that while they can define the scope of an adjudication how they wish, if that, if that definition of the scope includes a claim for payment, a responding party can bring in any other elements of the account in defence of that claim. So I'll hand back over to, to Jeremy or, or pass on to Stacey. Thank you, George. Um, and hello, everyone. I'll, I'll, I'll take it from here. So my um, task now is to give you a roundup of the adjudication cases since our adjudication update number three, which was back in November 2020. So 
that's a rather um, tall order. I won't be able to cover everything, but hopefully I can give you an overview and a flavor of these cases since then. So two initial observations. One, as Jeremy already mentioned, the Scottish courts have been particularly active um, in, adjudica in adjudication enforcement cases. And several of the cases I'm about to mention are indeed those cases um, and mention um, and come from our neighbors in the North. And secondly, as George has mentioned, uh, the arguments of that the arguments of natural justice and no jurisdiction are often not successful, but still a clear possibility. And here over the five, the last five months, that certainly um, is reflective of that. And indeed, uh, the high the high bar that you have to jump over to be successful. So moving on to the first case here, we have uh, the Fraserburgh Harbour Commissioners against. McLaughlin and Harvey, here a Scottish case. And these, um, the works were too deep in part of the Fraserburgh Harbour. Apologies for my um, pronunciations today. Uh, and there were defects in the works. Um, Fraserburgh Harbour brought an action before the court for damages in excess of 7 million. And McLaughlin and Harvey said that the terms of the uh, W-2 of the NEC contract were a mandatory step prior to the issue of court proceedings or arbitration. So the question before the court was, did the clause W-2.4 of the NEC-3 operate as a contractual bar requiring that the dispute be first referred to adjudication prior to the court? On the next slide, I have set out for you clause W2.4 of the NEC3. And the two points here are really um, what you want to look at. Um, the first at um, subclause one, um, a party does not refer any dispute um, under this contract unless it has first been decided by the adjudicator in accordance with co this contract. And two, um, after the adjudicator notifies uh, his decision, a party, if a, if a party is dissatisfied, um, effectively they must give a notice of dissatisfaction um, within four weeks of the adjudicator's decision. Now on the next slide, we have here uh, the findings in that, perhaps no surprise, the judge found that the parties had to adjudicate before uh, they arbitrate. And in this contract, the form of the tribunal um, uh, agreed with what was our arbitration. Um, the judge adopted the analysis in the Anglican Waters Services case back in 2010. And the judge said that ignoring the express words of the contract would effectively permit a parallel regime of dispute resolution and would render nugatory clause W2.4. So adjudication was the contractually agreed first mode of dispute resolution. Now, on the second, on the next slide, we have, um, I, now this is not a recent case, but whilst we're on um, the first topic of, of adjudication and NEC contracts, I just wanted to, to give a reminder of this notice of dissatisfaction and how important, important it is. So you may wish to look at the Fermanagh District Council um, versus Gibson case. Um, and here, uh, Fermanagh served um, a notice of intention to refer the dispute to arbitration out of time. Uh, so a timely reminder on that one. And on the next slide, again, just again, not a recent case, but in terms of on the next slide, you'll see the Sittall versus Feingold case, uh, fairly recent, 2018, uh, not since November 2020. But here, this was the referral to adjudication was made out of time because a reminder that you do have in the NEC contract, um, the contract requiring the parties to refer a dispute within four weeks of becoming aware of it. So I just wanted to um, point out these two cases as we're talking about NEC um, contracts. And if we have the next slide, the two things to remember, again, about the when using NEC contracts, one, unless agreed otherwise or amended otherwise, you must adjudicate before you arbitrate or litigate. And two, don't forget the notice of dissatisfaction, which must be served within four weeks of the adjudicator's decision. Now, these 
perhaps surprisingly, these are seemingly straightforward, but I can tell you from experience, um, the parties do seem to um, forget these two provisions for whatever the case may be. Um, so very, very important to remember. So turning on to, on the next slide, um, I'm going to move on to the cases concerning uh, adjudicators' jurisdiction. Now, to start with, let's just to recap on what do we mean by this. Uh, uh, Judge um, Coulson, uh, as he said, he simply stated uh, the fundamental principle. I don't know much in law that can be simply stated, but he did so uh, in his, in his well-known and well-published book. So basically, a jur um, adjudicator's jurisdiction, if he has not been va validly appointed or he decided something other than the dispute that was referred to him, his decision will be unenforceable because it, will, it would have been made without jurisdiction, simply stated. So on the next slide, distilling that down, the adjudicator's decision will not be enforced if one, the adjudicator goes too far and exceeds their jurisdiction, or two, the adjudicator does not go far enough and fails to exhaust their jurisdiction. Next slide, we'll look briefly at the, ca the recent case of Hawk Teeth Solutions um, versus Maspero Ali Vatori. Um, <clears throat> this, a Scottish case, and it concerns the Queen's Ferry Crossing. That's the third bridge recently built, um, opened in 2017, next to the fourth rail and road bridges. Um, it's now the world's longest three tower cable stayed bridge, quite an engineering feat. And this dispute concerns um, the lifts um, in the three bridge towers. Now, Maspero was the subcontractor for the design, manufacture, installation, and commissioning of those bridge towers. Hoptieve terminated that subcontract and Maspero did not accept that. Ultimately, <clears throat> the adjudicator found in favor of Hoptieve and Maspero refused to pay some 1.25 million pounds. On the next slide, so we have um, Maspero argued that the adjudicator, so unusually here, we've got, we've got an argument of both the adjudicator acted in excess of his jurisdiction um, in that the dispute did not fall under the terms of the subcontract, but rather a separate and distinct new contract. Um, and two, the adjudicator failed to exhaust his jurisdiction by failing to address substantive lines of the defense, as we've seen in other cases. The judge disagreed on both accounts um, and, the, and found that the adjudic adjudicator had the jurisdiction to decide on whether it was a new agreement or not, and two, he had taken into account in this case Maspero's submissions when just in this particular point when deciding whether the design costs were covered by clause 12.3.1c. So on the next slide, basically with this case, we don't see any new law here, but it is a timely reminder that it is a huge hurdle to demonstrate that, it, that an adjudicator acted outside of his or her jurisdiction. And two, I won't go into the details of the case in this, but if, you're, if you are going to challenge an adjudicator's jurisdiction, you need to do so appropriately and clearly if you want to be able to rely on that um, in due course. On the next slide, I have set out some um, of the details of the Bar Hill case that George was um, referring to. So I won't go into that in detail for you. You will have a, the, a copy of these slides um, and a, uh, the on-demand recording of this will be available on our website. So I won't go through the details of this, this case, but a Scottish case and, and uh, on point that the adjudicator's uh, decision in this case was set aside. Um, turning to the next slide. This is the um, Ex Novo versus MSP case. And here, it, this was um, back in December, I believe. And here, the TCC had to consider whether substance and jurisdiction overlapped. Now, the substantive issue in the dis in the dispute was whether um, was that MSP had not served a pay less notice, and the jurisdiction question was how many contracts had the parties entered into. 
Was it one contract under which instructions were issued or were they four separate contracts? Now, the adjudicator had decided there was one contract and the judge held that he decided that there was one contract as a preliminary point to determine whether he had jurisdiction and should continue rather than as a part of determining the substantive issue between the parties. So what this meant was that his jurisdiction decision was non-binding on the parties and could be challenged in enforcement proceedings. So um, tricky this one. However, on the facts of the case, um, the, the adjudicator's decision was enforced because the judge found there was no real prospect of there being multiple contracts. So upheld. Moving on to the next slide. This is the case of Aqua Leisure versus Benchmark Leisure um, 2020. Now, um, this, this case goes back to the points of um, that Jeremy was ra raising about um, severance. Here, the adjudication included, the, the adjudication decision included some 12,500 in respect of legal costs. And the adjudicator uh, granted that under, as he said, powers, so I'm struggling with the slides, my apologies, under section 5A and a typo of the late payment of Commercial Debts Interest Act 1998. Now, the judge held that the adjudicator had no jurisdiction to make that award on costs because the statute under which that adjudicator purported to act, um, the Late Payment Act, had no application. But what the judge did in this case was the judge severed that part of the decision, so that, as Jeremy explained, the bad part of the decision, and enforced the good part, the remainder of it. Now, I won't go into the detail of the remainder of that decision. <clears throat> Very useful, though. And um, one thing to, to look out for when you do um, review it is that it does cover a, um, a reminder that in the absence of a compromise, um, you will revert back to the adjudicator's decision. So in the absence of a compromise, the parties had basically in this case, there was an adjudication decision, some back in, um, the contract was in 2015. Um, several years later, you had you an adjudication decision. After that, the parties then entered into uh, negotiations trying to get to an agreement. Now they didn't in the end, um, they had a compromise. The sums were still due under the 2015 contract and under the terms of the binding adjudication award because they had not come to a binding agreement. There was no subsequent agreement that superseded the award. All the parties got to was a document that was headed subject to contract and that's what the judge said. It was subject to contract. They did not form binding agreement, and therefore the adjudication decision was to be enforced. On the next slide, this is a rather unusual case. Um, Motakis Constructions versus Paolo Castelli Spa. Um, it's unusual in that um, you're dealing with foreign jurisdiction clauses here. Um, an interesting project where the works were in, were in London, the governing contract, the governing law of the contract was Italian, and it was subject to the jurisdiction of the courts of Paris. Um, now, when it came to the uh, an adjudication that had taken place, um, Paolo Castelli said that the court did not have jurisdiction to determine the application because it had been brought in breach of a clause in the contract which conferred exclusive jurisdiction on the courts of France. Now, the judge considered the Hague Convention uh, and so forth, and in the end enforced the adjudicator's decision. One of the reasons being it, the adjudicator's decision is an in interim rather than a final and conclusive re remedy. Um, I shall leave you with that one. And I think, on the next slide, uh, we have one. We have one final case here. Um, 
I wanted to include this case. You won't find it on uh, Bailey, actually. Uh, Bailey being a uh, publicly available website where you, if, if you don't already know, you can go and find uh, many of the uh, these decisions uh, of the TCC there. But you won't find it there. I wanted to include it though because um, it's a, it's about enforcement proceedings um, and costs. Now, interestingly, in this case, Faith Dean versus Bedford House. Now, the defendant did not pay the adjudicator's decision of some 1.5 million pounds. They didn't raise jurisdiction objections. They didn't provide a defense other than to say that it that it intended to defend the entire claim and would make payment after it knew the exact amount. And the court said, um, no, um, that was not reasonable. No, that was not a reasonable course of conduct. The defendant, they held that the defendant had to pay the cost of the enforcement proceedings on an indemnity basis. So at a more penal, higher, higher level of costs um, because the defendant had, had known or ought to have known that had it no defense to enforcement, it would still have to pay, pay the amount due. Now, I, I do want to say that something out of the norm does have to happen or occur before indemnity costs are awarded. Um, and here the, judge, the court held that this was not a reasonable course of conduct. And with that, on the next slide, I know I have done an absolute race through these cases since October 2020. So I did want to leave you with details of where you can find more information on each of these cases. Um, and that is the Fennec Elliott Dispatch newsletter um, edited by a highly regarded um, member of Fennec Elliott. And um, please do find out more information about each of these cases there. And I think, Jeremy, I shall hand back to you. Perfect. No, thank you very much, Stacey. Um, so before we get on to the questions, we just wanted to, on the next slide, highlight one or two issues that we think will be important in 2021. We think there will continue to be more adjudications. Um, there's this question about if there are more adjudications, should adjudicator nominating bodies open up their lists so that the adjudicator panel becomes more diverse? And I think that most adjudicator nominating bodies are trying to think about how they can address this. But remember too, I mean, what everyone talks about um, how you can become more diverse. Well, remember that the one of the options might be in the hands of the parties. Parties can appoint adjudicators. Um, back in October um, 2000, um, people didn't tend to propose adjudicators because if you knew that if you put forward two or three potential adjudicators for dispute they would be immediately treated with suspicion and rejected by the other party. I think over the last 20 years we've become a little bit more sophisticated and there's no reason not to treat appointment of adjudicators like there would be with the appointment of arbitrators. So maybe um, improving diversity is actually in the hands of all the parties. Um, the other thing I just wanted to highlight is the role of adjudication in dispute avoidance. Now, as we all know, ADR just simply means alternatives to dispute resolution, alternatives to the court. So adjudication already fits that bill. But one thing we're seeing and something the JCT um, in, announced earlier in the week, um, that they're going to be introducing um, rules for dispute boards in May uh, 2021. And I think one of the reading from what they've been saying, I think one of the things they're going to try and do is allow the dispute board um, to be the adjudicator. So it'll be very interesting to see um, how that pans out when the JCT rules come out, because one of the good things about dispute boards is that they're there to promote dispute avoidance. So I think that's something to watch out for as 2021 um, progresses. But there's just time for a couple of questions. Um, and one of the questions that came in, uh, during George's um, talk, I think was actually addressed by Stacey. And it was really, um, how often um, is it the case that um, allegations that there's been a breach of natural justice or allegations um, that an adjudicator has exceeded their jurisdiction? Um, how, how successful are they? And I know that we've perhaps distorted, I mean, I'll take this one. I know that we've actually distorted it a little bit by talking about cases where decisions weren't enforced. But Stacey also said that these 
cases are not off, they're not successful very often. The, um, the, the, the 10 points from uh, Judge O'Farrell setting out the steps and the points that people need to consider if you're going to bring a claim. But Stacey also said it's a very high bar. And the reality is these cases only very rarely um, the decisions aren't enforced because of a breach of natural justice. Um, but another uh, question has talked about, well, adjudication is known as a rough and ready um, process. I suppose in many sense the question is, well, why use it then? Um, I don't know, George, if you've got um, any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, adjudication is intended to be speedy. That was sort of uh, baked into, into the process when it was first introduced. Um, and I mean, I, I say that, but I, I'm working on adjudication at the moment where um, it started in, in January and we'll be lucky to get a decision before the end of Easter. So I, I know that the, you know, the length of time and the process of, of, it, you know, often goes beyond the statutory 28 days. Um, but Jeremy, you mentioned uh, Lord Briggs's quote in, in the uh, Supreme Court case of, of Bresco and adjudication has been given a ringing endorsement um, by, by the Supreme Court judges there. Um, well, while it's perceived to be uh, rough and ready, um, it's all, it's, it is, of course, um, and, and ultimately it is slightly rough and ready, but ultimately a, a party who's unhappy with an adjudication decision um, can, can take it to litigation um, or arbitration. Um, but the, spe the, the speed of the process is, and, and the availability of it is what is, what is, uh, what is so, so attractive. Um, and one of the oft quoted statistics in relation to adjudication is that um, actually the vast majority of decisions um, aren't taken, uh, aren't sort of unravelled and taken into litigation and arbitration. So, so it has been and remained and continues to be an incredibly popular method of dispute resolution in the construction industry, and I fully expect that to continue. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think I entirely agree with that, and I think the success of adjudication, um, not just in the UK, I mean, it can be measured by the fact that adjudication is being adopted um, um, globally um, by a, a, an increasing number of uh, countries and jurisdictions. Um, and Stacey, just to finish with, um, you mentioned a lot of Scottish cases. Um, it's a great question. Why are we being, you know, lawyers based in London are dealing with sort of the law of England and Wales, so interested in these Scottish cases? Isn't it a completely different environment and place? It is. It's not, it's far, it's not that far away, though, is it? But yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it is a different legal system. Um, it's a mix of uh, the uh, with elements of common law and civil law uh, within it. But let's remember that there are statutes and legislation that apply to both England and Wales and Scotland. And as it as it is, Scot Scottish decisions can be persuasive on the English courts. Scottish decisions are not are not binding on the English courts, but they can be persuasive. And particularly in those situations where we have those statutes that are in that are embedded within both jurisdictions, and in the, and in this context, that's the Housing Grants Re Reconstruction and Generation. I'll get that wrong. Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act, as amended by the Construction Act, and I won't give the long name for that one. Um, anyway, so it is, um, you know, that 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 that's in both jurisdictions. Um, so therefore, Scottish decisions can be persuasive. Now, they do they do in Scotland. They do have a different um, scheme for construction contracts. Um, the uh, Scottish reg reg regulations version. Um, so there is a different scheme up there. But yes. Um, English judges can can be pers persuaded by Scottish decisions. And Scottish judges can be persuaded by English decisions too. Um, that's great. Um, George, Stacey, um, thank you very much. Um, as Stacey mentioned, these slides will be available very shortly and a copy of the, um, the webinar will be um, available on the Fennec Elliott um, YouTube channel. Um, there's just time for me to um, encourage you all to attend our next webinar in two weeks, next Thursday, 8th of April, while Stacey will be joined by Rebecca Keating, a barrister at Four Pump Court, to look at smart contracts and AI in construction. So thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks' time.